Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. Is it crazy to anyone else that it's the week of Thanksgiving? Like, does it not feel like it shouldn't still be September, but it's November's almost over? Uh, so crazy, it's grown fast, but we're glad all of you are here with us today. Uh, I know myself, I am extremely happy to be here uh, with my church family. And for those of you who do not know me, my name is Michael, uh, one of the pastors on staff, our young adult pastor here at Grace. And the past few weeks, We've been going through a series, Living in Light of His Return. We know that Jesus, who has always existed, and he was actually there when the earth was created, he's always been there. He came to earth 2,000 years ago to live, to die for our sins, he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. But the Bible says that he is coming back. And his second trip is going to look a lot different than his first. And so while we're waiting, what are we supposed to do? What's it going to look like? What are the signs we're looking for? All these things that we've been talking about and are going to discuss, and we've been doing that mainly in the letters of the Thessalonians. And the Apostle Paul is writing to a church uh, in a city called Thessalonica, and he's writing them, teaching them about the end times. He taught them about the rapture, about the day of the Lord, which uh, we've talked about the past two weeks. And so if you weren't here for that, you weren't able to listen to those, I would encourage you uh, to go to YouTube, find a podcast um, of Pastor Zach's sermons. It really will help kind of set the stage of what we're talking about today. Uh, but he taught them about what the day of the Lord is going to look like. And we said that this is a period of time where God is dealing with evil in the world directly and dramatically. He's dealing with the world directly and dramatically, um, judging for their sin and evil. And again, we have a timeline on the screen, just a general kind of, okay, the world's ending, end times, how are the events kind of ordered? Jesus came 2,000 years ago, we are in the church age, and we know there is a future event called the rapture, that God will take all his believers uh, up, take us to heaven, take us home. And after that, uh, and soon following, maybe a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple years, after the rapture starts the tribulation period. And that is a seven-year span that we will be focusing on today. Uh, and then after that, there's the battle of Armageddon, Jesus returns, there's a millennial kingdom, and then after that, a final battle, and, and we'll talk more about that in a few weeks. But that's just a general kind of timeline. And so we are in this seven-year span that we're focusing on this morning, and we talked a lot about last week what it's going to look like. And we talked about the seals and the trumpets and the bowls. Doesn't sound all that fun, if you remember. And this church that Paul is writing to, they are afraid because they're looking around their city, their world, and it was getting bad for them. They were facing persecution and death and a whole bunch of things that just made them wonder, like, wait, did we miss something? Did we miss the rapture? Because it's getting pretty bad. And Paul said that it would get bad. Are we in the day of the Lord now? So Paul writes them to comfort them. He writes a second letter, 2 Thessalonians. And that is where I want to start us off today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
verse 1 and 2 says this. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily upset or troubled, either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come. They thought they were living it. They were living in security because Paul told them, hey, you don't have anything to worry about. You follow Jesus. You know, he's going to make sure you're, um, you're set. But someone came along and confused them. There was some wrong teaching either in the church or outside, and they started to believe, wow, maybe we uh, missed the rapture. Maybe we are in the day of the Lord. But Paul says, don't be upset, don't be troubled, because two events have to happen to begin the day of the Lord. In verse 3, we find out what the first one is. It says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. So that's the first thing. He says the apostasy has to happen. And this word, it just means uh, to abandon a former authority. And so most people take this to believe that people are claiming to be Christians but not true believers because as a genuine follower of Christ, we cannot lose our salvation. God doesn't just drop us and lose us. But this is saying that it seems like there will be a great number of fake Christians who turn from their beliefs, who turn from what they know to be true about God, or at least what they think to be true about God. So much so that it's noticeable from the ones that were doing it then. That's the first thing. But Paul goes on and gives a second prerequisite to the day of the Lord. And this is where we want to spend uh, most of our time this morning. So we'll read verse 3 and 4. It says, Don't let anyone deceive you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. And so to begin and lead this charge, this rebellion against God is who Paul refers to as this man of lawlessness. You might know him as the Antichrist. And um, if you are, if this is one of your first times here, it's going to be a fun topic today. <laughs> um, you, you come to church, just what you want to hear, right? The Antichrist. But this is some, someone, a real person. This is a real individual. This isn't abstract. This isn't like figurative for um, anything. It's a real person that is going to play a huge part in the day of the Lord. And so when we talk about this uh, world leader, it's going to sound pretty crazy, pretty bizarre, and it, it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird when we lay out the timeline and everything that's happening. But we think about it, and the Bible tells us about a man taking over the globe, declaring to be God. And when we hear it like that, it sounds more like a Hollywood movie than the Bible, right? It sounds more like, okay, well, that's, you know, that's kind of crazy. Is that actually going to happen? But this leader is found all over Scripture, and he goes by many names. Paul refers to him as the man of lawlessness or the man doomed to destruction. Daniel calls him a ruler or a prince to come. Uh, Zechariah calls him a foolish and worthless shepherd. John calls him the Antichrist. And in Revelation, he is referred to as the beast. And we all, and, and he's also depicted as the first seal that we talked about last week, um, as he promises to, to begin with peace. But we all want to know, right? Like the big question is, yeah, the Antichrist does this, that, but who is he? And let me just get this out of the way. <laughs> it's not Trump. It's not Biden. <laughs> all right, going to just put that out there for those of us who are thinking, one or both. Um, but... If we ever find out, if we're ever living on this earth and we know for sure, okay, that's the Antichrist, means we're in trouble because we missed the rapture and we don't want to be here for this. So we are not going to know who this is until this time comes, but let me give you a rundown on his character. Okay, we're going to talk about what he does and kind of events of his, his, his rise, but let me just show you who he is, all from the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 tells us that he rises from obscurity and grows to global power. Daniel says that he is intelligent, 
that he speaks arrogantly, that he wages war against Israel, that he is a political leader who will lead a ten-nation confederation which, uh, by which he will conquer and rule the whole earth. Daniel 8 says that he is skilled in planning, that he is a ruthless king that causes outrageous destruction. He is set out to destroy all types of people. He succeeds in whatever he does, and because he's so cunning, he will prosper because of his deceit. He will exalt himself, and he has great power. But that great power isn't his own. He is directly influenced and under the power of Satan himself. And so in summary, he's defiant, he's destructive, and he's deceitful. Doesn't sound all that wonderful, right? Can we agree? It's probably not who you want your daughter to bring home to meet the family for Thanksgiving dinner, right? Uh, doesn't meet the, the qualifications there. But we see who this is, or we, we, we know about him. And again, I want to remind us that the Bible is talking about an actual future. That this is real people, real nations, real events, and it's easy for us to forget that. Because you may wonder, okay, well, what does his reign actually look like? How does a guy like that even get into power if he's that bad? And we're all thinking right now, hey, I wouldn't follow that guy. Like, he sounds pretty, pretty rough. I, I wouldn't buy into it. But what we have to remember is that his rise will take place after the rapture. Zach mentioned last week that it could be, it could be less, but there could be billions of Christians gone. In an instant. Billions of people from this earth that, who are saved are taken away. And so you can only imagine just the, the disorder and confusion that's happening to the world you know, around them. And with that rapture, again, billions of people taken from this earth, you can imagine the damage to the economy, to just uh, families in general, to personal lives. And that means Chick-fil-A is probably dead, which is even more sad. Um, but, <laughs> just joking, but in all seriousness, after this event, people are going to be looking for peace, for stability. They want answers. They want somebody to follow. Like, they want somebody to kind of have it all together that will lead them into something more promising. And that's what he brings to the table, is that, uh, you know, just like every other political leader who promises that they have a better plan for peace than the other person, but he will actually begin his uh, rise with peace. But the problem is it's focused all on himself. And one of the events, one of the early events that could set the stage for this world leader is laid out in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Now we're not going to read it, but when you do, you read about a future attack on Israel. And Israel, again, they have a specific role in prophecy in the end times. And we read about a future attack on Israel by northern nations. And so you can go and read um, who God is kind of calling out and what people he's describing would be involved. And obviously we have to contextualize that to today. That will be a part of it. But most likely, um, as I'm reading, most scholars, most people believe that it will be a combination uh, of nations maybe like Russia in alliance with other nations like Turkey and Iran and some of the other um, ones that end with Stan, or Stan, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce them, but those ones. And we see, we see that this, uh, when Ezekiel is writing this thousands of years ago, there's really no common denominator as to why all of those nations would want to attack Israel. But now, it kind of makes sense. That if you look at countries that are hostile towards Israel today, you could see that, okay, it makes sense that it could be Russia and a coalition of Muslim-based nations. And so, uh, and even a side note, the fact that Israel is a, um, is a nation today is a sign that God is working towards this. Because it wasn't until 1948 that they were established. Okay, And so for over 2,000 years, uh, they weren't independent. It wasn't always possible. But we see God working just in the last century, for us living in 2021, in the last century, God is making his way to make this more and more of a conceivable thought. 
And so this attack on Israel, again, which will be after the rapture, uh, these countries, most likely, they're looking around the world and seeing the chaos and kind of disruption and going, okay, this is our chance. We're going to seize this opportunity. And their goal is to take out the Jewish people. And God says that they march, they get ready, and they clearly outnumber Israel. It seems like, wow, it's really no competition. They're going to win. Uh, it seems like it will be in their favor, but God steps in. It says that God will fight for them. The Bible says that he sends an earthquake. He brings confusion and causes them to attack each other. He sends rain, hailstone, fire, disease. It is clearly a God victory protecting his people. And the Bible mentions kind of the aftermath that it will be so bad that it will take Israel seven months to bury the dead. Seven months. And after this attack, again, that the Bible talks about, we can see how it's a possibility with these countries now weakened, a lot of Israel's enemies, with them weakened, it would be easier for this world leader to kind of enter um, into power, to take control. And it's after this, or around this time, that we see his first big move, which reveals who this guy actually is, reveals his identity. We read about in chapter 9 of Daniel that the first thing he does, and this starts off the, the tribulation, the seven years, that he actually signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. He signs a seven-year negotiation, which again could be simpler now, that maybe some of the um, enemies of Israel are weakened and they were defeated. But this leader promises to protect them, help them with any threats, and also tells them that they can begin to worship again how they want. And they would be able to begin building the next temple. And so this is very important. And if you know anything about Israel now or, um, again, what God says about prophecy in the end times, that it is uh, very important because right now the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is pretty much under Muslim management. But with them out of the way, it would give room for this leader to allow Israel to, again, build their temple. And you can read about this right now. You can Google how they are preparing for it. The Jews there, they have uh, structural pieces, like, fabricated, ready to go to actually build. Um, I don't know if it's completely ready, but they have a lot of the pieces ready to build the structure. They have um, the sacrificial altar items. They got robes. They got things that are, you know, needed to sacrifice the way they want to. And this treaty is the beginning, like I said, of the seven-year tribulation period where God is uh, showing his judgment on sin. And it's split up into two sections, three and a half years, three and a half years. That's how God uh, divvies it up. And so this world leader is essentially uh, ruling an empire with other kings, other leaders. And it seems like we're going to go on uh, to talk about you know, kind of what he does it's going to seem like he's gaining traction, because he is. He's growing in power. He's rising. But I don't want us to forget, or I don't want us to believe that God is absent. I don't want us to forget that God is still working uh, in the world at this time. No matter how bad it gets, God has always given his people a chance. We read in Revelation 7 that God will raise up 144,000 Jewish witnesses to begin uh, this massive revival. And so the Jewish people, from cover to cover of the Bible, they were meant to be a witness to the world, for them to follow God and, and, and show others, hey, you should allow God to lead your life too because, you know, we're doing it right. They were meant to be an example to others, but they failed to do that. And we can see as they've mostly rejected Jesus as their Savior. And this 144,000, maybe a lot of you guys have heard that number thrown around. You don't really know what it means. Uh, a lot of confusion has come from the Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that that number is um, like a kind of a cap of people who can, a limiting number of people who can get saved or have this hope. It's not the case at all. Uh, it's not a limiting number for us. It's an exact number in the future. And these are people who turn to Jesus after the rapture. And begin to share the truth with others. And because of what they're doing, it says that many people are saved. Uh, John is seeing in his vision and revelation, he sees 
the people who are saved because of these witnesses, because of them sharing the gospel and sharing the truth. And John says that it's a vast multitude from every nation which no one could number. So John's looking at these people going, wow, it's a sea of people. I can't even count them. God is still working. And in, in addition to those witnesses, God sends two separate, extremely powerful witnesses as well. The Bible says that they have power like Moses and Elijah. If you remember Moses, he was the one uh, to lead God's people out of Egypt from captivity. And Elijah is known as one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament because of his faith and belief. He did crazy miracles. He brought fire down from heaven on the prophets of Baal, all these different things. But these two prophets, or so these two witnesses, we don't exactly know who they are. They could be just random people that God decides to, you know, uh, raise up. Or uh, a popular belief is that the, it's actually Moses and Elijah themselves who God brings back to earth uh, to do these things. But they are testifying to God. They're performing miracles. And it says that they do this for three and a half years. They're sharing truth, sharing the gospel. Um, people come to be saved. But this leader directly opposes them. We read this in Revelation 11. It says this. When they finished their testimony, the beast, again, just another name uh, for this world ruler, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the main street of their great city. When this happens, when this leader kills these two witnesses, it says that the city and the world erupts because they are happy. They're joyful. The Bible says that they actually exchange gifts because they're so happy. It's like Christmas morning to them because they are tired of having these guys on the streets yelling about Jesus and God all the time. They're happy that they're dead until Revelation 11.11 uh, 11 says, but after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. Now, not only is this a pretty sweet scene to think about, <laughs> that all the people that are walking by their bodies, and, and by the way, this is something that um, the Bible says that the entire world sees this event. For the majority of existence, we're thinking, wow, how does the entire world see this? Like, does everyone have to walk past their bodies? You know, no. Right? We live in a time where there's probably people <laughs> Instagram living this. Like, they're, they're putting on YouTube. They're taking a picture, TV, phone. Everyone is seeing this happen. And then God, three and a half days later, brings that rises them back up. It brings them back to life. And it says they ascend into heaven. So again, pretty sweet scene to think about. But what I want us to notice from these two different groups, the two different groups of witnesses, is that God is still giving a chance for people to repent. That even though he is showing his um, judgment on the world for sin, he's not leaving them completely hopeless. He's communicating truth to them. He's giving them an opportunity to realize that they are sinful and they can turn towards God. It's the same chance that God gives us today. That we all have an opportunity with our lives and we don't know how long we have, but all of us have the chance that truth is presented to us, that Jesus has died on the cross for our sins, that we have to acknowledge that we cannot earn our salvation, we can't get to heaven without him, and so we place our faith that Jesus died for our sins, that he is enough. His death and resurrection satisfies God's wrath, and we choose to follow him. We have that same opportunity. And God is not completely absent. And the midpoint of this uh, peace treaty, it's a seven-year treaty. He says, I'll protect you guys. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, I, I have your back. Three and a half years into it, he shows his true colors. Daniel 9 tells us exactly what happens. Verse 27 says that this leader will make a firm covenant with many for one week or just uh, seven years. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop 
to sacrifice and offering. What he is going to do in Jerusalem, he's going to go to the temple, which again, if you remember, they are able to build at this midpoint. It's finished. It's completed. They have it ready. They've been um, you know, doing religion. They've been sacrificing how they want. This leader steps into the temple, removes everything, places himself in the center, and demands that he is worshipped. Now, again, he's always been a um, pretty bad dude. But this midpoint is really where it begins that he is outwardly and clearly cursing God, persecuting Christians, attacking the Jews, doing more and more evil. And again, people still worship him. People follow him. And by extension, they follow Satan. Revelation 13 uh, says this, talking about this leader. One of his heads appeared to be fatally wounded, but its fatal wound was healed. It says the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which is just another name for Satan. So they worshipped Satan because he gave authority to the beast. They worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against it? So the Bible tells us that sometime during this takeover, uh, this leader is at some point either killed or almost killed. And we don't know if Satan brings him back to life. We don't know if Satan heals him. Or the whole thing is just kind of uh, deception, if it's just a trick, just to make people think that he's more powerful than he is. We're not sure. But from this event... This response brings more followers his way. And so you got to understand, this guy seems unstoppable. It's like, okay, initially he brought peace, and sure, he might be a little crazy, but man, I'm following this guy. Like, he can take a shot to the head, and he's fine. People begin even more and more to follow him, and he's not alone. The Bible says that he even has um, a right-hand man, or a sidekick, if you will, who does everything in his power to force people to praise the world ruler, and his name is the false prophet. We read about him in the second half of chapter 13. It says that he exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. It also performs great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And verse 15 says that he causes whoever would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this false prophet, this guy who's basically second in command, he, uh, his job is to mislead. His job is to deceive and he can do some um, cool signs and um, impress some people. But his job is to make this leader look good. And he forces them, he forces people to worship the leader. And the Bible says that if they don't, it says that he kills them. So they either follow him or die. They have such a control on the world that it says the false prophet actually requires a mark to allow you to buy or sell anything. Revelation 13, 16 says, uh, And he makes everyone, small or great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the beast's name or the number of its name. And so again, another thing that most of us have probably heard of, right, the mark of the beast, this is where we get it from. Um, but it says that this is a real restriction that the false prophet will have on the world, that if you don't submit to the leader, if you don't get the mark of the beast, you can't do anything. That you're restricted. You can't purchase gas or groceries. Uh, you can't buy. You can't sell. And there's a good chance that, again, th this leader will be killing Christians, killing anybody or anything that has to do with Jesus. But there's probably a lot of people who maybe they won't be murdered for their faith, but simply because they don't want to worship this guy, then they're limited. They're probably going to starve. They can't do anything. They'll have no food to purchase because um, they didn't get the mark of the beast. And again, let me just throw this out there for maybe there's one person in this, in this room. The mark of the beast is not the COVID vaccine. So I'm just going to say that. Uh, I know you guys are like, oh, they're restricting us. Yes, but this is not it, okay? But along those lines, 
we can see today how it's really not that crazy of a thought to see that the government or, you know, how much control that the government could have. Like, we could see how this is a possibility, that you have to prove your allegiance, you have to prove that you have, uh, again, you have a mark, you have some sort of sign, and especially with us moving towards a pretty cashless society, you know, e even me, I don't use cash that much, I know we all have Venmo, and if I check my phone, or if I check my bank account, it's on my app on my phone, you know, we're moving towards that, and so we can see how this is a possibility, that it's, it's not really crazy to think that you know, your mark is scanned before every purchase. You have to prove that you have submitted to him. And so this leader, along with the false prophet, he has political power. He has religious authority. He is even governing commerce, that he is dominating with a one-world government and a one-world economy. He continues to gain more power, kill more people, bring himself more praise, and bring about more evil. And he is a tool for God to directly deal with the evil in this world. And this leader is the final epitome of all that has been set against Christ. A figure of evil that we, the Bible paints a picture of this guy. We haven't seen a level of evil like this at all. We can look back at history and look at the Adolf Hitlers of the world. The Bible paints this guy you can take Hitler times a thousand and maybe we'll get close to there. This is the final embodiment, the final culmination of all hate towards God. All evil, all sin is found in, in this guy leading this charge. And I know this isn't the most cheerful sermon we've, we've ever, ever had. But I hear these things and a couple things, comes, uh, a couple things come to my mind. One is that I am uh, glad... That I'm not going to be here for this. It doesn't sound all that enjoyable. But two, I wonder what, like, how does that affect me now? Uh, this is future events. Okay, if, if, you know, if we have this right, we're going to be raptured. And then if we're not even here, why is God telling us all this? Like, what does it matter to me today? Let me read you what John wrote. He's the person who wrote Revelation. Let me tell you what John wrote in another letter about how we should view the Antichrist. 1 John chapter 2 says this, Children, it is, the, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, he says, yes, there is a future uh, person that is going to embody evil, powered by Satan. Yes, he's going to be a real person. He's, he's coming. But even now, many Antichrists have come. By this we know that it is the last hour. Who is the liar if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? The one is the Antichrist, and here's how he defines it. The one who denies the Father and the Son. John's saying, yes, there is an Antichrist, a leader, uh, to come in the future. But he says, as he wrote this 2,000 years ago, there has been many Antichrists during his time. And so it's like, wait, there's more of these guys? Not, not in the end times prophetic way. But his definition of an antichrist is anyone or anything who denies the father and son. Anyone who rejects the gospel. And with that definition, we can see them all over. We see people, we see plans, we see motives that are set to oppose Jesus. We see this in every false religion who says, yeah, you can get to God many ways. It's by being a good person by um, doing good that, no. But we see it in false religions. We see it in people simply rejecting God's standards, his morals, his values. We see that billions of people are actively running from God. And you know what John is saying? He's saying, yeah, okay, think about the future. There's gonna be a lot of evil then. Yes, great. But don't just be prepared for the future. Be ready for today. Be ready for now. People are rejecting Jesus now. And some of us, we are the ones rejecting Jesus. But like I said earlier, God is still offering us a chance to know him, to be forgiven, to trust in him. But yet we don't make that step in faith. Maybe we push it off and we say, oh, maybe later. But we don't really know how many more chances we'll have. 
And some of us need to realize that until we're in heaven, there will always be evil, sin, and those who reject Jesus. And if we look at the end of the chapter, John tells us, hey, that's going on now, so how do we, how do we be ready for it? Verse 28, and, and we'll end here. Verse 28 says, so now, little children, remain in him. Remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. What does it mean to remain? Re- remain means to continue, to abide, to dwell, to basically just hold your position. Like you're not going anywhere, you're, you're committed, you're devoted. And so what does it mean to remain in God? Well, it first means that we recognize what he's done. That he offers us eternal life. And when we accept his free gift, we commit ourselves to him because we realize how great of a gift that really is and how much he loves us and how much we don't deserve it. And that becomes not just a one-time decision, but a daily devotion to choosing to know God and grow with God. So much so that every area of our lives then becomes impacted by his word, which only happens when we read and know his word. Remaining in God means that we pursue him, that we no longer, uh, God says that when we delight in him, when we follow him, when we know who he is, that he will change our desires, that we don't want just what we want, but our desires become his desires. And then we grow in obedience, we begin to impact others and live in opposition to the evil that we see in the world today. And we do that by being ready by being steadfast, by being immovable, by remaining in the only constant force we have in our lives. And that is God himself. So the question is, are we doing that? Are we remaining in God? Are we every day striving to know him more? Not just claiming to be a Christian, claiming to follow him, but are we living for him? Not only reading the Bible, praying, and coming to church, those are all great things, but are we committed to following him, being devoted to him every day? What things are you doing that get you closer to him? What things do you need to stop doing to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, realize, okay, they don't really help my faith, they don't help my relationship with God? What do you need to change to be more ready for today? And as we go on, um, we read in the Bible, that um, this world leader, towards the end of, uh, of the seven years, that it says he gathers all of his troops, his resources, his armies, and it says he gathers them for one uh, final attack on Jerusalem. And again, we, we know that is the, the Battle of Armageddon, but it is there that he is planning this attack, and that is when Jesus returns. And so next week, that's what we're going to talk about. What does that look like and how great of an event that will be for him and those who follow him. So make sure you're here for that. Let's go ahead and pray this morning um, as we wrap up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, allowing us to be here to freely and openly worship you, God, and learn about your word. And, and everything we talked about today, God, it can sound strange. It can be um, it's kind of intimidating or confusing or um, even wondering how it all, how it, it's going to lay out. But God, you tell us these things to bring us comfort, to know that we have placed our trust in you. And so you are going to be there with us. You're never going to forsake us. You're not going to, um, you know, we can't lose what we have in you. But God, help us to grow closer to you. Help us to remain in you, to know you to a greater level every single day and live in this world, who we know there's a greater evil coming, but God, there's evil and sin, and and Satan is working now. Help us to be ready for what we face today as we wait on your return. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.